Jill Dando was murdered on her doorstep. Murdered outside her West London house. She saw him staring down both sides of the road. Said the woman known to millions for her television appearances was his perfect Jill. She was the darling of British broadcasting and her murder, a crime that horrified the nation. After 24 years of mystery and intrigue, a new Netflix true crime documentary is investigating the circumstances around the 1999 homicide. Killing Jill Dando. The news came in that a woman had been killed. It was Jill. And it went terribly quiet. The Daily Mail led the way in reporting on the case. This is the story of Jill Dando's murder. Jill Dando was quite simply one of Britain's most celebrated and loved television presenters. She started her career on local newspapers where her father and her brother worked and then she moved very quickly onto the BBC, regional news. She ended up becoming one of the most famous faces on British television. She read the news, she presented Holiday, one of the BBC's most uh, popular weekly programmes. She presented Songs of Praise and she presented on Crime Watch, which was a BBC programme back in the day that helped the police to solve unsolved crimes. Viewers loved her from the start. She was a friendly celebrity. She came across as a girl next door type of person. On the morning of Monday, April 26, 1999, Jill Dando woke up at the home of her fiance, Alan Farthing, in Chiswick in West London. Mr. Farthing is a consultant gynaecologist who later went on to become the Queen's private physician and was part of the team who delivered all three of Kate and William's children. Jill left the Chiswick property at around 10 a.m. Jill's last known movements on that fateful day were covered by CCTV, eyewitnesses, and till receipts and mobile phone calls and things like that. But it's just her last moments that remain a mystery to this day. Jill had been staying at the home that she shared with her fiance, Alan Farthing in Chiswick. And on the morning of April the 26th, 1999, she drove back to her own home, number 29 Gowan Avenue, which is where she was shot. In the half an hour before the murder, she was picked up on CCTV doing some shopping in Ryman's in Hammersmith, driving along the A4 back to Fulham where she lived. At about 11.30 that morning, Jill's next door neighbour, Richard Hughes, heard the familiar beep beep of her BMW convertible when she parked up. 30 seconds later, he heard a scream, but he didn't hear any gunshot. He heard the clang of her gate, and when he looked out the window, he saw a man hurrying away. That was undoubtedly the killer, and his was the only confirmed sighting of the person who killed Jill Dando. The last phone call Jill Dando took was at 11.23 a.m. The next phone call came at 11.31, by which time she was already dead on the doorstep of her home on a quiet, leafy street in Fulham. She'd been shot in the head in an execution-style killing. We saw Jill uh, a few weeks before she died. Um, she was killed in April 1999. And earlier that month, it was Easter. And Jill came over with her fiancé, Alan, uh, and my father, Jack. And that was the last time I, I saw her. Well, I used to be a, a reporter on a local newspaper, the Bristol Evening Post, and I was working in the newsroom on the day that she died. Um, and initially, I had a call from, uh, I think it was a reporter, actually, on the Daily Mail, who I knew. And he rang me and said that I heard that Jill had been involved in an accident at or near her home. And I hadn't been. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about it. So I made a couple of phone calls, one to uh, Jill's mobile and one to uh, Alan, her fiance at the time. Uh, and I couldn't get answers from either of them. So I thought, well, there's probably nothing. I hadn't heard anything. And he rang about an hour later and he said, oh, I think it's been a bit more serious than an accident. And at that time, alarm bells started to ring then. The fact is, Jill Dando was probably dead 
before she hit the ground. Eyewitnesses who saw her in the moments after said that they were convinced she was dead. Understandably, the paramedics did their utmost to save her, but as a consequence of that, it became quite hard for the police because the crime scene had been trampled all over as people tried to do their best to help her. Any forensic evidence was being stepped on and possibly very vital clues had been lost. It was a chaotic crime scene and it made the job of detectives quite hard. The Mail revealed in 2019 that an official police report blamed the resuscitation efforts for creating a major, perhaps insurmountable obstacle to future detective work. The unusual lack of forensic evidence at the crime scene would become a hallmark of the Dando case. Whoever killed Jill Dando followed her up the steps as she tried to get into her house, put his arm around her and pulled her down to the ground and then very quickly placed a gun to her head and fired one bullet. Post-mortem showed that the gun, I think it was a 9mm pistol, was placed right against her head and the bullet was fired just above her left temple and exited just above her right temple. The markings showed that it was pressed very firmly against her head which would have dampened the sound and possibly explained why none of the witnesses heard the gunshot. It appeared at first that this was an assassination carried out by a professional hitman. Jill Dando was a hugely popular presenter, but as police began to investigate, they discovered a huge number of possible enemies. One theory, amongst many others, was that the shooting was a revenge contract killing commissioned by a career criminal convicted of murder after a crime watch appeal. There was even speculation that it was ordered by a notorious Serbian warlord. It wasn't that long before police had identified no fewer than 1,393 possible suspects. They had a huge job to eliminate them all. The suspects included one of Jill's neighbours, a boyfriend from her old church who was also a serving police officer, a fantasist who falsely put himself near the murder scene, and a harmless obsessive. The list went on. But as police narrowed down the search, it came down to just nine possible suspects. One of the most persistent theories that was investigated by police was that Jill Dando had been murdered on the orders of the Serbian warlord and underworld boss known as Arkan. Now, in April 1999, the month that she was murdered, uh, British warplanes were taking part in NATO operations over Serbia in Yugoslavia to halt the ethnic cleansing of Albanians by Serbian forces in the province of Kosovo. Now, Jill Dando, just three weeks before her killing, had fronted a BBC broadcast appealing for funds to help refugees who had been affected by the fighting. You can call now on 0870 60 60 900. That's 0870 60 60 900. And you can make a donation with any credit or debit card. Two days before her death, the headquarters of the Serbian equivalent of the BBC had been bombed by NATO. It had killed 17 staff at the equivalent of the BBC. There was an outcry. One of the theories was that Jill's murder was a revenge attack for this bombing. Jill Dando herself, Mr Mansfield said, was seen to be the personification and embodiment publicly of the BBC. But right from the start, police had their doubts about this theory. Police investigated it and eventually, with the help of the security services, they identified a suspect a Serbian gunman. The Mail conducted a painstaking reassessment of the Jill Dando case in 2019, the 20th anniversary of her death. My colleagues Stephen Wright and Richard Pendlebury tracked down the Serbian gunman. They spoke to him at length and he was convincing. He never killed Jill Dando, he said, and nor did Arkan ever hire him to do so. He had an alibi, which police had appeared to accept his old passport he showed my colleagues, bore entry and exit stamps showing that he'd been in former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia at the time Jill Dando was killed. He was not in London. 
And by the way, the BBC's World Affairs editor, John Simpson, was in Belgrade in April 1999, covering the war for the BBC. And he himself has pointed out, he, he met Arkan, this warlord, on the day she was killed. Simpson's pointed out himself that if it was true the Serbs wanted a high-profile BBC person to be murdered in retaliation, he would have been the obvious choice. It would have been much easier. He was right there. At the time, there was a reward of £250,000, £100,000 of which was put up by the Mail newspaper. And yet, no one came forward to claim that money. And while the killing was certainly proficient, there were several contradictions from the crime scene. A shell casing found on the doorstep was from a reactivated firearm, which would certainly not be the weapon of choice for a professional hit. Almost 12 months into the inquiry, the investigation began to focus on a man who lived 500 yards away from the murder scene. A serious sex offender, serial stalker and fantasist with a fascination for the BBC, female celebrities and the SAS. 16 years before the murder, this suspect had been discovered in military gear, hiding in the grounds of Kensington Palace, Princess Diana's home, carrying a knife and a rope. His name was Barry George. When detectives searched his flat in Crookham Road, they found amid piles of rubbish were scores of undeveloped films. Uh, these contained more than 2,000 photographs of more than 400 young women, largely taken on the streets of West London. Police found four copies of the BBC internal magazine, Ariel, bearing a portrait of Jill Dando on the cover. And they found a photo of a man who the police said was George, wearing a military respirator and holding a modified blank firing pistol. The prosecution was an accumulation of flimsy evidence. There was only one witness who could say for certain that they'd seen Barry George on Gowan Avenue, and that was hours before the murder. But he was put on trial, and on July 2nd, 2001, he was found guilty by a majority of 10 to 1 and sentenced to life in prison, for his conviction was quashed six years later. Barry George appealed several times. In 2002, I remember seeing him at the Court of Appeal, sitting behind the black bars in the dock as he tried to have his conviction overturned. On that occasion, he was unsuccessful and the judge uh, rejected his claim that his conviction was unsafe. I remember Barry George simply raised his eyebrows when the judges said his conviction would stand. In 2007, Barry George appealed again. This time, his appeal focused on a microscopic particle of firearms discharge residue, which was found in a pocket of his coat and which was said to be a match for a similar residue found on Jill Dando's head. At his appeal, scientists suggested that this particle was worthless as evidence. It was just as likely this particle had come from innocent contamination in a police lab or from the general environment, just as likely that as it had come from the murder weapon. The three appeal judges said that the jury that convicted Barry George might have reached a different conclusion had they known about the doubt about this crucial gunshot evidence. And George's conviction was quashed and a retrial was ordered. Barry George was being defended by a top QC, William Clegg, and he described his client as the local loner. Mr Clegg, QC, said George was intellectually incapable of, of committing such a meticulously planned, carefully prepared and successfully executed murder by a cold-blooded killer. The jury agreed and after seven years, Barry George was a free man. Barry George, an innocent man, has spent eight years in custody for a crime he did not commit. Those eight years... My own opinion is that I tend to think that it was somebody who struck lucky on the day in question, somebody who had a gun in their pocket um, and who saw Jill, for whatever reason, uh, as a target and, and shot her dead on her doorstep. But uh, 
why, who knows? I'm always interested in, in new theories about uh, how Jill may have died. But when you look at them, and I look at them from a journalistic point of view, as well as from a member of the public's point of view, as well as from a relative's point of view, and very few of them hold any water at all. Um, and I just happened to think it was, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Nearly two and a half decades on, the murder of Jill Dando remains unsolved. And that makes it one of the most enduring mysteries in British crime history. She was murdered in broad daylight in a leafy street in West London, and no one saw a thing. There were myriad theories, there were hundreds of suspects, but in the end, two and a half decades later nearly, the killer remains at large.